Welcome to the official YouTube channel for the Colin Coward Podcast. Go on, hit the subscribe button. There it is, so you don't miss any of our football content this season. It has been, if I might say, fantastic. Our week nine reaction presented by Uber Eats. Get almost, almost anything for game day. It's time for this week's player I thought might give almost, almost anything back to redo his game. How about Jameis Winston? Three picks, sacked six times, Brown lost to the Chargers. Cleveland, rough season, no matter who the quarterback is. That was this week's Uber Eats Player of the Week. Get almost, almost anything for game day delivered with Uber Eats. I love it. The official on-demand delivery partner of the NFL. Order now. <clears throat> All right, John Middlecoff, it's time for our hour plus on a Sunday. He is the former NFL scout for the Philadelphia Eagles. Three and out podcast. Let's start with a team you're near and dear to the Philadelphia Eagles. So they did it on the ground, in the air. They beat the Jags 28-23, although Jacksonville with a <laughs> massive late-game comeback. Trevor Lawrence, uh, one got a little loose on him. He threw a pick in the end zone. You know, my takeaway on this is, I, I, I'll go back to saying this, Jalen's not making the mistakes, and Barkley, Saquon Barkley's absolute, with Christian McCaffrey not playing yet, Barkley's the best running back in the league. And I think what Jalen Hurts, as they win today, my take is they've gotten him out of the position where I don't feel like he's ad-libbing or out of control. Like I thought Jordan Love today for the Packers was out of control multiple times. I, I kind of think Philadelphia's figured out kind of the way to use Jalen. What what do you see? Well, I think Saquon's definitely changed their team. I mean, he's been him and Derrick Henry. You talk about additions this offseason, those two guys. Uh, I mean, Derrick Henry was probably a Hall of Fame player before this. Now he cemented himself. I mean, there's no one's ever questioned Saquon's talent. I mean, what would Penn State do to have that guy right now on their team? I mean, they would not have an offensive weapon. But to me, I mean, the only reason that ga game was close was Sirianni and, and Kellen. I, I'm not quite sure what was going on there with some of the play calling. Yeah. They, instead of kicking a field goal, they I didn't get decided that. not to do the tush push, and they they roll him out, and he's got nowhere to go. Like, right now, their offense, I mean, A.J. Brown, which is a pretty big deal, not maybe in this game, but I guess they play the Cowboys next week, so not in that game either, but in two weeks against Washington, his presence for them to beat really good teams is a must-have. But when you're playing a team like today, Devontae Smith, what a draft pick. I mean, I thought, wait, this guy's going to be 175 pounds and dominate in the I, NFL. I didn't think he would last in this league. How about his one-handed touchdown catch? Oh, my the God. The so you had Saquon to him. I mean, the guy that had the game-winning uh, interception, Kobe Dean. I mean, they have a lot of young defensive players. The last couple of weeks, Nolan Smith has been all over the quarterback. Like, I, I trust Vic Fangio. To me, it just gets down to Sirianni, who, if they had lost today, Colin, to Doug Peterson and the Jags, who they had fired, do you know who, I mean, Embiid would have been let off the hook because it would have been a Sirianni. You, you cannot lose that game, and it got weird. Obviously, the freak Saquon fumble, but... Yeah, it's a little too close for comfort, given how well their top guys were playing. Well, oh yeah, I mean Barkley was great. Jalen went like eighteen to twenty four, two hundred thirty yards, no, you know, no uh, interceptions. Their re their receivers that were on the field were excellent. They actually, I mean, they they had four hundred and fifty plus yards of offense, six point five yards per play. Um, they were great on third down. They dominate time of possession, and you look up and you're like, you're at home and it's twenty eight twenty three. It, well, they were up twenty two nothing. Right. It looked like they were going to blow him out 40 to 10 or something. Yeah. I just, I, I just feel like, um, I kind of feel like this is the rare instance. And I felt this a couple of years ago with Detroit, but I've come to terms with Ben Johnson, the coordinator for the Lions. I didn't trust. I really didn't trust Dan Campbell. I do now. I think he, I think he has grown. I think he's a little less emotional now. I also think he realizes. Uh, he's no longer hunting. He's being hunted. They're the favorite. I think he, I think like today they got a lead. They got real smart. They got real conservative. It was really, really smart Lions football. I, I, I think I feel like Sirianni's like Dan Campbell a couple of years ago. He's still trying to prove himself. I want to show you guys how smart I am. And then when you make mistakes, like yelling at the crowd and get your hand slapped by the owners, then you kind of double down on, I want to show how smart I am. And there, I just think, with Dan Campbell, I've seen growth. I do think yeah. he's a better, more mature coach today. And with Sirianni, I I think they're going to get to the playoffs, and I think they're going to have all these weapons and outplay people, and I think they're going to lose to a really smart, efficient team. Yeah, I, I think in two weeks, Colin, I was looking at the schedule this week doing podcasts, and they play the they play the Cowboys this upcoming week. So I mean, they can 
put a nail in it completely end their season. Right. Thursday night. So this upcoming Sunday and then the following Thursday, they play Washington. And I think we all agree. I mean, Washington played the Giants today. That game wasn't even a game. But right. the talent on the two teams, the Eagles have a better roster. I mean, we all thought that at the Chicago game. Like, Chicago has the better wa- roster. But Dan Quinn, Cliff Kingsbury, they have been, talk about a tandem, a, a head coach, offensive coordinator tandem, yeah. rookie quarterback. All the pressure in that game in two weeks, or less than that, 10 days, is on the Eagles. So when those when they play Washington twice, in Philly and, and at Washington, it's 100% on Philadelphia. I mean, Washington is going to be a playoff team, but they're playing with house money. If they were to win the division, it would be one of the most incredible accomplishments we've ever seen. So the pressure on Sirianni, if it's a tight game, does he do one of those things where he doesn't kick a field goal and they get stuffed? They kind of don't trust the tush push as, you know, it didn't work a couple times in this game. It didn't work, yeah. So to me, you're paying your kicker a lot of money. I know he missed a kick, but like he's going to make most of them. Like kick field goals, they do matter at the end of the game. Like they could have lost today because they had kind of given their way to going forward on two points and not kicking field goals. So yeah, Sirianni is the biggest wild card in the league because there's no disputing when healthy, the talent on that squad. All right. Atlanta beats the Cowboys 27 to 21. So if, if you didn't watch this game, uh, I could sum it up with the multiple false starts, the nine penalties for Dallas, too many men on the field on a fourth down. Atlanta basically got out rushed out past But Dallas was so bad on fourth down, so many penalties, so inefficient. And Kirk Cousins just go out, goes out 19 to 24, doesn't make any big mistakes. Like Atlanta's not physically impressive, but Atlanta's really efficient because they brought Kirk Cousins in, who just doesn't make a lot of mistakes. He gets you in and out of plays. When I watched Dallas today, Mike McCarthy, Mike McCarthy's frustration with, I mean, when you have Dak Prescott and you're a veteran team, you, you can't have false starts, illegal motions. Like, I feels like to me that is so much on the quarterback. Now, he left and Cooper Rush came in. But I, you know, I had said before the year, this was one of my, uh, I guess I'm actually wrong on this. I said, Dallas won't make the playoffs. It'll be Philadelphia and Washington in that division. It will begin a slight regression. John, they may be a bottom four team in the league. And I'm dead wow. serious. They're, they're, they're better than the Raiders because of Dak. Uh, hell, and Cooper Rush. I think they're better than Carolina, probably better than New Orleans now. They weren't in week two. Dallas is a bad football team without a lot of good players. Yeah, I thought coming into this week, we were going to learn, like, are they just going to end up sucking all season and being a five or six win team? Or are they going to have a little heart and battle and, you know, at the end of the year, be eight and nine, but have shown some metal throughout the year? I, I think they're headed toward five or six wins now. And yeah. today, didn't it symbolize before the game even kicked off? They less they left Zeke back at home. Yeah. All I had heard from Cowboys people is, listen, we know he doesn't have as much, but the leadership, the yeah. camaraderie, him and Dak are close. And then these stories about he never shows up on time. He's disgruntled. It's like, well, then why is he on the team? And is that a little? I'm not putting this all on Dak, but isn't that Dak's one of his best friends? <laughs> like, so what? What do we got going on there? And then as the game goes on today, it was a reflection of they don't have that much talent. I mean, how oh, no. often did today, even on like just random innocuous plays, Bijan in space out in the flat and three guys would whiff and he'd get eight yards that should have been Listen, one. Listen, John, on a fourth and one, they have so little talent in the backfield. On a fourth and one, they had to use deception on a quick, on a, uh, like a jet sweep to CD land. No, around, it yeah. Didn't even yeah, get- it, it worked about 20 minutes later, same play. But on a fourth and one, with, with a very strong quarterback, Zach Martin, one of the great guards ever, they had to get clever and tricky. They have no run game. One of the easiest predictions anybody could have made going into this season is Dallas would have the worst running back room in the league. I mean, we watched Zeke in New England. He, he can't, he's done. It's over. They made no moves. They, they, uh, it, it's it, it's remarkable. Now, I'm not saying Derrick Henry would be as good as we've talked about in Dallas as Baltimore. You start looking at, I've said before the season, if CeeDee Lamb twisted an ankle, it's the worst offense in the league. I mean, it's, 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 it, I watched them today and I'm like, they, it was just all a cotton candy yards. I mean, it, it, Atlanta was so much smarter, more efficient, good on third down. I, I was, I was playing golf the other day with a diehard Cowboy fan. 
this guy has been to countless games over the last 30 yeah. years. And I, I asked him, do you think Dak Prescott's better than Tony Romo? And, and you are always one of Tony's biggest defenders. Yeah. And he said, you know, I, I would have told you four or five years ago, yes, but at this point in time, you can't watch these games. Up until Tony's back when he was a more dynamic player. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and in 21, 22, and even last year, those teams were so good. I mean, in 21 and 22, the Cowboys were really good. I mean, they had a home playoff game. They were toe-to-toe with the Niners in the second round. And they're, I mean, Dak didn't just have one bad play. Like, he was atrocious through most of those games. So I, I think, listen, this is not his fault. You know, in terms of the pie chart, 100%, if they go six or seven or maybe five wins. But he has kind of crumbled. Like, he has not been an elevator. Talk about trailers and tractors. Clear where he falls. And honestly, today was just an embarrassing day for the organization. I mean, I yeah. think Mike's hands were on it. Jerry's hands were on it. Because the Zeke thing, to me, symbolizes, I, I thought that moment, I, I thought the Bears benching the guy for like two series, like this is not Little League or high school. We're not teaching life yeah. lessons. You either leave him at home and yeah. make him inactive to show like this will never be tolerated, or you just start him. Like this is a business. You know, we're trying to win or lose. I got no, I would have made him inactive to show everyone just like the Cowboys did. Zeke, you're not showing up, but th- there's no middle ground. This isn't high school football where it's like, you're going to sit out the first series or two. Like that, that to me is so dumb. I mean, that, that that's, that's embarrassing at the highest level. It, it just, the, the, that's why, you know, certain teams lose and obviously the same teams consistently win over and over. Time for our segment called Making It Look Easy, brought to you by Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury law firm. Joe Burrow made it look easy against the Raiders. I thought this would be closer. Burrow, five touchdowns, 250 yards. Vegas is toast. Burrow hit four different receivers for touchdowns. Cincinnati's first home win of the year. Believe it or not, just like Joe made it look easy, so does Morgan & Morgan. So easy to submit a claim. Over 100 offices nationwide, Mover, that Morgan & Morgan has over 100 offices nationwide, more than 800 lawyers. And over the years, proven track record, fighting for you, they have claimed over $15 billion for their clients. Morgan & Morgan, fighting for the people for over 35 years. If you're ever injured, go to forthepeople.com slash Colin or dial pound 529. Check out America's largest injury law firm. Winning in the NFL is hard. Hiring Morgan & Morgan is easy. A game today that I thought was important and symbolic. Arizona crushes the Bears 29 to 9. Um Kyler Murray barely had to throw. Um there was a lot of I mean they led 29 21 to 9 at half. I think the bigger story is Caleb Williams was ineffective. The offensive line was overwhelmed. The offensive line, I've talked about this so many times John, defensive coaches and offensive lines are a problem. The Bears, Caleb's been outplayed badly by Kyler Murray and Jaden Daniels the last two weeks. Um, He's dancing around in the back, getting sacked by Arizona. Offensive line's gotten worse. And I watched today, there was a safety on the Bears at one point as they lost 29-9. to There wasn't a, there wasn't, once we got to the second quarter, there wasn't a minute I thought Chicago could win. I think Caleb is clearly, even though Bo Nix got rolled today, Baltimore at home is a much better. That was one of the easiest bets of the year, taking the I Ravens agree. minus eight, nine. Bo Nix looks like he's got it under control. I mean, he, there's. I think he really looks like, for the personnel they have, obviously. He actually, Jayden, he actually didn't play terribly today. No, I mean, he, no, he wasn't. He wasn't he just, fault. I mean, they don't have seven guys who would start for the Ravens. <laughs> yeah. They have Patrick Sertan, maybe a safety. That's about it. But – when I look at Caleb right now, they average 3.4 yards a play. It is screaming to get rid of Matt Eberflus. I mean, I just, the whole game, I'm like, this, it just doesn't work. He doesn't have the right coordinator. It's a mess in Chicago now. Well, if I had told you by the middle of the season that if the Bears called up the Washington Commanders and said, before the season, and said, would you trade Jaden Daniels straight up for Caleb Williams? And the Commanders would laugh at them <laughs> and hang up the phone you would have said the Bears have serious issues because two things can be true. Today was an embarrassing day for Eberflus, but so was last week. And so was this offseason when it was pretty clear you're putting this guy into a lame duck situation. This is not a McCarthy that at least, listen, I know he's under his last year, but he has a long resume of success and he coaches the quarterback. 
who you're going to pay $200 million to. This is a head coach. Yeah, he's a good defensive coach. Never won anything, and you have no faith that he's going to do it. And now you have to fire him a year in. But I, I think the, the bigger picture, you see it with Trevor Lawrence. I mean, they brought in Doug, and it, this is just not going well for him relative right. to the hype. These things can snowball and get out of hand fast, and you invested – Actually, you didn't because you made the trade, but you got this player. You chose him over these other players, specifically Jaden, who, again, long way to go. I mean, ideally, they both have 15-year careers. Jaden right. Daniels is currently one of the best players in the NFL. No He's question. One of the best players in the NFL. And looks and Caleb, totally under control. And Caleb looks like a mid-round pick forced to start because a quarterback got injured in the preseason. <laughs> like, he makes some plays, but he misses a lot of stuff that – Listen, we saw him make in college, and this gets back to people that were questioning him. He can freelance and get a little willy-nilly, yes. and that doesn't really work in the NFL. And you see him just get peppered. He's not comfortable in the pocket. The coaching staff's terrible. I, I do think the Tyreek Stevenson benching was just a joke. Uh, and, and if I'm Eberflus, I wouldn't want him inactive. I'd want to just start him. But if you're Ryan Poles, you're not going anywhere. You want to show all these other guys that like the standards are high. They're in no man's land. Right, they, they really are, and I, I doubt they would fire. I mean, that's a fireable game. I don't expect the yeah. Bears to fire him, but like these last two weeks, I mean, they were thoroughly outplayed the week before too. Right? It was, you know, I know the hail yeah. mary, but they, they were worked that game. Like we know before they even get to the tough stretch of their season, like this ain't a playoff team. <laughs> like this team, I mean, Arizona that to me is like a fringe wild card team. Just beat the living piss out of them. I, I just can't take the Bears seriously anymore. No, and it, this was supposed to be the two-game stretch, Arizona and New England next, where they had a shot, right, to, to make totally. up some ground before they go into Detroit, Minnesota, San Francisco, Green Bay. You know, I think there, there's – I've always said there's one or two things in football that are undervalued, and yet they're things we know are valuable. I think a great offensive coordinator or great offensive coach, you're better on third down. You're better on offensive line. You're better at drafting offensive personnel. I mean, ha the Rams just figure out ways to mix and match their offensive line. They're in a wild one with the Seahawks today, but they're still, you know, ham and egg in, it in the interior yeah. of the offensive line. These defensive coaches, Chicago's offensive line last year felt like an ascending group. You had your tackles, little soft in the middle. It is a mess with Caleb Williams' mobility, it's a mess today. So I just think you get to a point where you – I don't think people understand the difference between a really smart offensive coach and an average defensive coach. It is I, a touchdown to 10-point difference a game. I, I, I do think, too, that moment last week on the Hail Mary was reflective of their head coach, right? Because let's take a couple of top defensive coaches, right? Tomlin – uh, John Harbaugh, a special teams guy, but he also a DB guy. Y you could never envision that play with that player happening, taunting the crowd. Like that, that just would never happen with the Ravens and Steelers in that moment. So to me, that reflected, let alone like he's been pretty good on defense. Today, he loses his best defensive player. James Conner looked like Walter Payton against him. I mean, it was like, you, you guys are that dependent on one guy. And offensively, I always talk about like defensive guys know nothing about offense. Right? I mean, they they know how to stop offenses, but they don't. Know, they're not calling the plays. They're not in their coaching. You know, in terms Brady, of during Brady the week. made Brady made fun of Belichick, not even understanding the terminology of offense. Yeah, it's just it's so I. The Bears, honestly, this goes back to what ten months ago, eleven months ago, when they knew yeah. and, and they tried to have their cake and eat it too, and keep their fingers crossed, and. Now they're going to have to fire this guy. And it sets the whole clock off when they could have just started at scratch. Maybe Ben Johnson would have been interested. Maybe they could have hired Vrabel and just had a fresh runway. Now you derail everything. Because one thing you would say is like, well, Eberflus is kind of good on defense. So now yeah. you get a new guy. It just, it just you know, upsets the apple card, which needed upsetting in January. <laughs> I mean, and today was, today was really bad because coming off that loss, I, I thought two teams – had huge bounce. Like to me, the Ravens of last year blow the team out and they did today. So it's like, okay, you know, the Browns game, weird outlier. Jameis got hot, throw that away. The Ravens are the real deal. And the bears like, okay, if this is going to be a wild card team, they come into Arizona, right. even if it's tight, Arizona's not easy. Yeah. You win the game. A lot of, I live out here. 
I, I would imagine that would half half the stadium was Bears fans. Yeah. So it's a big deal for them. And they got, like you said, that game was over before it even started. They got shellacked. Arizona is in first place. I've been saying they look this good. For three... <laughs> they look good. They look good. Now they've got the Jets, you know, a team that um, you know, looks good at home on Thursday nights, but has not been a team that can go on the road. And it feels like the Jets only play home games, I swear. So now they go on the road to Arizona between McBride, Harrison, who's hot and cold, Kyler. Um, their protection's okay. I I, I just how I good the tight the tight end is a is a fantastic McBride. player. Yeah, yeah. Um I think Arizona is a sneaky good football team. And I think the Jets Arizona next week is a fantastic oh, game. Yeah. It's a great, and it's, I don't want to just talk about the bears because we've been on this for about a month. If you don't watch Arizona and you, you know, you're saying, who are they beating? No, they, they beat San Francisco. They got dudes offensively. They are, they've got a star every unit and I, and they're good enough on the offensive line. You you've been on Connor since last year, the running back. So this, this isn't just about Chicago, Arizona, Arizona keeps you on your toes. They didn't even throw the ball for long stretches today. They just moved the pocket and highly effective. You, you know, one thing, remember after they lost the Super Bowl two years ago, everyone thought Jonathan Gannon was like the village idiot, right? Yeah. Cause he blew some coverages and they walked right in for touchdowns. And when he got hired, he had some of those moments that kind of went viral that made him look like a nerd or whatever. All my buddies with the Eagles said they loved him. And they said, I'll promise you this. I don't know if he's, you know, you know, Belichick or Bill Walsh schematically, but I think he's going to be a better head coach than he was a coordinator. And he was a pretty good coordinator for us. He's yeah. a great leader. And you watch his teams, Niner game, huge comeback. The Dolphins win last week. I would say age better today. They look way better with Tua. Like they look like a real football team. They were yeah. down double digits on the road. Usually West Coast teams fly into the East Coast. That early kickoff historically have always looked pretty shitty in that spot. Yeah. They come storming back. And then today you're like, oh, this could be a little letdown spot with the Bears, a little chip on their shoulder. And they came, they, they look like a division. They look like a playoff team today. Yep. And their physicality, I mean, Buda Baker, when he's healthy, he's flying around. Uh, their defense just well coached, makes a bunch of tackles. And they have a physical presence to their offense. And like yep. you said, like, I, I, I think Kyler. I know, and Jonathan Gannon has talked about this all the time, and I see him on a bunch of like local TV out here as press conferences. Listen, I can't speak to what he was like before me. This is him talking. He has been mature. So that Call of Duty guy, I, I do think he's been a lot better for them. And, and maybe it's just a bunch of people talking crap about him, you know, lights a fire under his ass. But they like him. I yeah. mean, just in terms of his work ethic relative to what it was for Cliff and Kime, I, I do think, and listen, some humans just... We all mature at different ages. Some guys are Peyton Manning, mature at 15. Other right. guys like Baker Mayfield, mature at 28. Some guys yeah. are like Aaron Rodgers, who we're still not sure. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, like, I, I do think we got to be open. You remember Kyler was a young player when he came into the NFL. And I, I do yeah. think he's just playing the way he's playing. is just pretty high level, competent football. And with his skill set, I mean, we've yeah. never really seen a player like him. Yeah. Okay. Detroit beats Green Bay 24 to 14. Uh, Brian Branch got ejected for the Lions in the first half, and I thought can't happen. Can't happen. I was like, oh my god, this is. It didn't matter. It was seventeen three at half. Jordan Love had a pick six. I thought Jordan Love today was really sloppy. Now it was raining hard when it started. It got worse. But I think you and I would agree that we thought that was an advantage for Green Bay. Totally. And and Goff is like seventeen to twenty one. This this is I think we just have to be honest here. Detroit's the best team in the league. Kansas City's got the trophy room. The team I'm watching now, the way they play. I mean, Green Bay had ten penalties. Jordan Love had a pick six. I mean, he missed a lot of open throws. Again, some of it's weather. But when you watch Green Bay's youth and talent, and then you watch, remember Detroit. Now those guys aren't as old as San Francisco, but the Lions are older, more mature. They marched into Lambeau today, and it was the grown ups. And the really talented kids. Like, I thought they just put a foot on them really early. Do you know what I wrote down is about when they really took hold of that game? In that weather and a driving rainstorm, it reminded me of the Belichick Brady teams when they would play a team in awful weather and you would just look up. It's like they are manhandling this team. And historically, I, I, this is their first outdoor game of the year. And yep. Goff has been not a very good outdoor player. But I do wonder if you remember that night game. Aaron Rodgers' last game, he outplayed Aaron Rodgers. 
I mean, thoroughly outplayed yes. him in a Janu- yes. early January game. I yep. wonder if he's a different part of having Dan Campbell, like a Harbaugh brother, like a Tomlin uplifting you, that, that, even that extra confidence. They look like a completely different squad. Once Jordan Love, through, to me, I don't want to harp too much on the Brian Branch thing. That that cannot happen. We, we can't be throwing players out. One of my biggest pet peeves in the world is the college thing. Yeah. Throwing 99% of these kids will not play in the NFL and throwing them out. In the NFL, I got no problem throwing a 15-yard penalty. But Brian Branch is now their best defensive player and throwing oh, them out. Yeah. And it didn't even matter. And that's what go back to the Pelajek Patriot thing. It's like you could remove players. They got you in that moment. And the Lions indoor team, like – are they kind of like the greatest show on turf in the early two? No, they kind of have it both. <laughs> they got that, and they kind of got this Patriots. Even Brady during the game, he's like, you know, listen, this guy has been the most accurate stretch in three games, like NFL history, but in this driving rainstorm, you never believe it. And he shows the thing, he's, he's 11 for 11. <laughs> like, <laughs> how is he doing this? And he was just, he's been the opposite his whole career. It's been not a inclement weather guy. And today he looked very comfortable. Obviously, Jordan Love's banged up. I thought yeah. they should have yanked him at halftime and gone to the other yeah. kid, but it might it wouldn't have mattered much at that point in time. Once he threw that pick six and it's seventeen to three, didn't it feel like the game was over? I mean, it was going to be hard to oh. score a touchdown in general. Well, it's really hard, you know, when a defense can't get traction with their feet and we have the better offensive line. I mean, there was a moment Jameer Gibbs had a touchdown run uh, to make it twenty four to three. The the size of the hole oh. for Jameer Gibbs, and I'm not joking. <laughs> it was wider than this desk. It may have you been would, you would have scored. It was eight feet. I mean, literally, Panay Sewell had moved his guy near the sideline. Brady's like, I mean, just, he's like, look at these tackles. Uh-huh. Their offensive line. It is. It rivals that Eagles team when Lane Johnson was healthy and, and uh, uh, Kelsey about four years ago when they were both the best at their position, they are moving. And, and the Packers' defense has been pretty good this year. They moved it all day in the first half. And we've been talking a lot about Jordan Love and, you know, comparing him. Listen, it's a good thing when Aaron Rodgers and Brett Favre's names are coming up. But this was a game in that weather where you cannot turn the ball over. Like, it, it cannot happen. You have to dominate on the run, you know, running the ball, control the clock, and play defense. And he did a play, which he's done earlier this season, reckless. You, you cannot afford to be reckless. That's why the Patriots in those games dominated. Brady would never turn the ball over, let alone make a play like that. And even Tom was like, oh, you cannot do that. He tried to lob it over. I don't even yep. know really what he was trying to do. You can't barely grip the ball. Uh, he is, I, I've said before, you asked me, I think a couple weeks ago, could they win the Super Bowl? And I said, they do have the talent. But he, he is way too much of a roller coaster ride. Well, Thursday night football is on. It's only on Prime Video. Best season yet, packed with big rivalries and even bigger stars. Al Michaels, Kirk Herbstreit, Kaylee Hartung. Every week, games you can't miss. Coverage begins at seven Eastern with football's best party. TNF tonight. Thursday night football tonight. If you're not a Prime member, no problem. Sign up. Thirty day free trial. Cancel any time. Thursday night football, and it's on Prime Video. Restrictions apply. See Amazon.com slash Amazon Prime for details. He there was a moment. There was a second and one, and Brady called him out, and 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 Brady said, "Dude, it's second and one. You got third and one, fourth and one. You're, you're trailing. You're going to go. And for you got it. a great running back. And he's rolling right, and he's pump faking, and it's just like Brady. I don't think he wants to be hypercritical of young quarterbacks." But it was like, and I like Jordan a lot, but there are times he's always been more far than Rodgers where he's he's going to he's going to sling it. And I do think against Detroit, you may have to because Detroit's got better personnel and they're older. But I kind of feel like. I, I kind of feel like. Um, today's a moment that you'll look at during the season and and we'll we'll revisit this. I think Jordan is going to have another one of these games later. We'll go back and well, there was early warning signs because I, I I really, really like him. And I, Reed is a remarkable young receiver. Jesus, he's good. But they looked young and sloppy today. They really do. Listen, I, I, I and I throw these names around when we're talking about these guys, but Rodgers and Favre have a combined seven most valuable players. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, and I, I am, I'm as guilty as anyone. And LaFleur brings it up. This kid has a long way to go. Like, can you just make yeah. back-to-back pro bowls? 
And yeah. th- th- you have games like today where you you're at home. It's a huge advantage for you. And you take your team right out of the game. Uh, you- you're not going to be able to throw three touchdowns. And I say this all the time about the Packers. You know, they get some of these home games and the weather just turns to shit. I mean, I'm looking around the league today. The weather's not that terrible. In most places a little cold. It, it is awful there. And yeah. you're just not going to be able, you're, you're, you're probably going to give up a deep, your defense might score a touchdown. You're going to have to run the ball. And the Lions are just a better version of that right now. They're just a better version of a team that can play ugly than the Packers, clearly. That's a rough L because I, I think that I, it'd be stunning now if the, if the Lions don't win that division, right? And all signs point to them being the number one seed in the NFC. Okay, I want to talk about, maybe not long, but Buffalo 30, Miami 27. And I can admit, um, you know, I've always said to a small, there's limitations in the AFC in January with a guy that can't, doesn't have a big arm. But until we get to January, when it's September, October, and November, and maybe early December, Tua today, I think I, I wrote it down 25 of 28, 231 yards. Now, it was a crisp day in Buffalo. And, and I've been critical of, you know, you gave him the bag. He's not winning in Baltimore, in Buffalo, in in these cold weather areas. But when I watch him play, and then I watch Miami without him, could I make this argument? He makes the Dolphins really good for 18 weeks. And he may never go on the road and win games. But look around this league. John, half the teams are horrible at quarterback. Or they're and I and I watched Tua today and I'm like, listen, this is Miami's a good watch. You can sell tickets. They can compete with anybody. I just don't trust them in January with him on the road. But if you ever won a division, you'd play at home in Miami. It's a different story. Is I think we know he's small. We're, we know he's not a great athlete. We know he doesn't have a big arm. But I think we have to be honest. We have to be honest about this. The Rams just won, by the way, in a deep ball. Stafford threw an absolute freaking dime to Demarcus Robinson for the win. We started this, folks, if you're listening, with the Rams game 2020 in overtime. Stafford threw a dime into the end zone. Jesus. Um, the Rams are coming. Keep an eye on them. They're 4-4 four and four yeah, now. With they're the really game. young defensively, but that Jared Verse, Jesus. But I want to go back to this. Is that not every quarterback, when you're in the AFC right now, Miami's ability to compete, be exciting and fun to watch with Tua, the, the, his value is really tr- proven when he didn't play. They were unwatchable. I watched them today. I thought they were going to win. The, I thought they outplayed Buffalo for most of it. Yeah, I mean, you could argue Dak comes out of the game. Cooper Rush just looks just like him. I mean, he does. Kind of, it doesn't feel like that big of a gap. Uh, a, I would say this, and I, I said it when he signed the contract. I understand having a player that can make you competitive and keep you in a playoff mix in the NFL. That's extremely valuable to selling merch. Right. But there has to be some sort of line of delineation of paying him like the top guys and just paying him. Like I, I my my whole thing with a player like that is like, couldn't you just give him 28 a year? <laughs> like, it's not like he's, you should cut him, but I can't be paying him 50, $55 million because he can't go against those guys and be better. Yeah. Than because you watch them today and you watch them the last two weeks, they become a credible football team with him. And they're no question. atrocious now. He he is a 100% a starter in the NFL and a good one. But to me, he's always been closer to 15 than he is five. And I just can't pay you like five if you're 15th. Like James Franklin. Clearly, he's a good football coach. Yeah. But paying him like Kirby Smart and like these other guys, like, yeah, you're always going to be disappointed. But you could do way worse. And I, I think there's got to be some middle ground and everyone's, well, these are the coaching salaries. These are the quarterback salaries. Like, okay, do that. And then you're always going to be disappointed at the end of the season. But if you, if Tua was making half of what he was making, which would still be an astronomical amount of money, instead of signing for 170 guaranteed or 160, let's say they just give him 90 and $30 million a year. Like, God, ah, it's a pretty good deal. Starting quarterback, he keeps him in the mix. He's a really good player. But where it gets controversial is you start paying these guys more money than, let's say, Patrick Mahomes. You're like, this makes no sense. This is crazy. It happens in the NBA all the time. We just had to max the guy out. Well, he's not a max player. If you want to do that, you you know what your fate's going to be. And I I think I I don't quite understand why no GMs like just franchise. What's going to happen, right? And they're always so quick to pay them 
that 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 money relative to the last guy that signed, and then they find themselves in trouble because the gap between him and Josh, Tua is a good player, and the gap between him and Josh is as big as the gap between Tua and his backups. Yeah, and the gap that gap's huge. Yeah. All right, I do want to talk about um, the Rams beat Seattle twenty six to twenty in overtime. Stafford, the difference is Geno Smith and Stafford. I both these rosters actually have good players. I mean, Seattle's yeah. got. Smith and Jigba, the receiver, Lockett, uh, DK Metcalf, not there today. Kyron Williams, Apuka got ejected for throwing a punch. Cooper Cup, um, Rams are still banged up. So it always feels like they're missing a receiver. But first of all, the Rams were awful in the first half. McVay, again, makes tremendous adjustments. Um, and they're just, you know, just... Seattle basically beat themselves. Gino had a pick six. He had three picks. Two were in the end zone. Yeah. Uh, Cameron Kitchens, the rookie from Miami, the Rams had a uh, third rounder, had two interceptions. This Rams team, and again, the defense is so young. Every two weeks I watch the Rams defense, and they're better, and they have playmakers. Jared Verse is a monster. That guy is just, he looks different than other NFL he, he's, guys. He's Khalil Mack. He's Khalil Mack 2.0. The power. Just That's what rolls he over. Ta- good tackles. Just rolls yeah. over guys. And it's interesting because um, I think Seattle should have taken a quarterback last year. I thought it was a big mistake. A, a general manager, John Snyder, I think smart. I would have moved up. I would, their roster doesn't need anything. I mean, you watch them today. They got corners. They got an edge rusher. They got a left tackle. They got great receivers. Seattle doesn't need anything. They need a quarterback. And Gino's a big, strong kid with an arm, but he just makes too many mistakes. But watching Matt Stafford today, Jesus, I- I'm telling you, I-, I-, I said this. Let's just take Lamar, Allen, and Mahomes off the board. Just take the best three players in the world off the board. They're all different stylistically. I'm not so sure Matt Stafford's not number four in this league. Forced to go rogue, hunted from within. This is Call of Duty Black Ops 6. Developed by Treyarch and Raven, Black Ops 6 is a mind-bending narrative and unbound by the rules of engagement. This is signature Black Ops. Dynamic moment-to-moment gameplay, including a variety of play spaces, blockbuster set pieces, action-packed moments, high-stakes heists, cloak-and-dagger spy activity, best-in-class multiplayer experience. You'll test your skills across 16 new maps at launch, including 12 core 6v6 maps and 4-strike maps can only be played 2v2 or 6v6. Marking the epic return of round-based zombies, the fan-favorite mode where players will take down hordes of the undead in two brand new maps at launch. You can look forward to even more exciting maps and groundbreaking experiences dropping into both multiplayer and zombies. So Call of Duty Black Ops 6 spy action thriller set in the 90s by the end of the Cold War, the rise of the U.S. as a single superpower. Head over to CallofDuty.com slash Black Ops 6. Get in the game. Call of Duty Black Ops 6 available now. Rated M for Mature. I I think he's just an... He's incredible to me. Yeah, I mean, it, it, to me, it'd be him or Herbert. Uh, I, I think Herbert with the age, if you did like one of those fake drafts, most people GMs would take it. But remember a couple of weeks ago on that on that Thursday night game when Stafford's ducking people in the backfield and throwing touchdowns, you're like, at 36 years old, the wear and tear on this guy to still be playing. I mean, we compare Favre to Jordan Love. Like, no, that's that's like the good version of Favre, Matt Stafford, <laughs> with right. the arm strength. He's a little bit of a gunslinger. Could have had yeah. a pick drop today. Like, he, he will make some mistakes, but you want to be in the trenches with that. I mean, the, the difference in today's game was one quarterback. I mean, think what Geno cost him. The pick six, the guy caught it in the end zone. It's the longest touchdown or pick returned in the history of the Rams franchise, 103 yards. That's a potential 14-point swing if they score a touchdown. Yep. And then the other pick, he lets the ball go. His guy's not looking at him. They're on like the four or five yard line and being held by the defense. You you cannot throw that ball. You see it all the right. time. What do good quarterbacks do? Throw it at the guy's feet. And just because they know you got to live to fight another down. And I don't think the Rams turn that into points, but still that costs you points because at yeah. minimum that's three points. And, and Gino, you look at him against the Bills, awful. Today in big spots against the Rams, really awful. good young defense, awful. 49ers, he hasn't beat them in five tries. So it's yeah. like, I think they were in a tough spot last year, you know, to mortgage if John didn't love one of the quarterbacks. Because the one thing you would say is he was on Russell Wilson right. Tried to trade Russell Wilson to the Browns for Josh Allen. He would have been right. 
So when he's like these guys, he's known maybe he didn't feel the guy he could get. I could see him loving Drake May, but would have had no chance to get up there. You know, Pennick's not really his style. Look at Gino. Like Gino is physically really gifted. Oh, no, no, around, very impressive. Arm. So I, I do wonder, you look at some of these quarterbacks, like the Cam Wards and the Shadors might be guys, but he would have to, because his team's still going to end up what? Like the 14th pick? Like you, you're going to have to mortgage a lot and there's going to be some other teams that need quarterbacks. So it's just difficult, but they, they cannot. I mean, when Gino called them this offseason, wanted a contract extension and John just hung up on him, like that was the right move. Because yeah. it, it's been one of the great bridge quarterbacks of all time. Would you agree with that? Usually bridge quarterbacks are a disaster. He has been listen, more than credible. Listen, I wrote it down today. If you'd never seen him play, he made four or five, I put three or four huge Gino throws. There are times he spins it. I mean, oh. he, you know, remember the, NBA, remember the NBA guy, Joe Johnson? And yeah. like, you look up and you're like, Joe Johnson's like one of the all time great scorers, but was never like a winning player, but he was all time get a bucket guy. Gino's one of those guys that stands in the pocket. And if you didn't know his history and just said, go throw a 40 yard out, that ball never dips. Like, yeah. he's got a hose and he can run. He just is one of those guys that I I think his judgment in crisis really regresses fast. He makes really big mistakes, and I, I think you know it. it I, I was I, I've been told this by two executives that Shadur Sanders is the best quarterback in the draft. Somebody else will take Cam Ward. He's electric. He's fun. You know he'll galvanize some locker room somewhere. But it it is it is tough because if you're the Rams and you look at Stafford. And I mean, Herbert's got a 10 year runway. I mean, you watch him today, like yeah. when they get a legitimate number one receiver, holy shit, watch out. Cause they're winning right now with, you know, it, it is patchwork at wide receiver. It's this guy, that guy will, this they're, they're going to be a team. No one's going to want to see in the first round of the playoffs. So, cause they're good on defense and that Jim Harbaugh is their coach and they could beat you 17 to 15 in the first round. Yeah. And that's where Seattle Gino played well. If you would just play, but like you said, freaks out in crisis. Well, when's there's crisis against the best teams, yeah. right? They get up and they kind of smother some of the shittier teams. Yeah. So, I mean, I think I, I just watched the Rams win that thing in overtime today. And my takeaway is take out Mahomes and Andy Reid. I would argue McVay and Stafford are the best head coach quarterback combo in the league. So I don't buy into this rebuild stuff. I think these guys, I don't think they could, I think their defense is better than the Lions. They would have to be completely healthy to beat the Lions. I think they can beat anybody else in the NFC. I think they can beat Washington, Philadelphia, Arizona, Minnesota, already beat them. I don't know if they can beat Detroit. All I'm saying is the record doesn't prove it. But on the, if they're healthy, I think they may be the toughest matchup along with the Niners for the Detroit Lions. That's how much I think of McVay and Stafford. Colin, for like four straight weeks, they played with me and you at wide receiver. I mean, they, they beat the 49ers with me and you at wide receiver and Tutu yeah. Atwell. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. I think that win against the 49ers, because it happened so early, will be overlooked as the season goes on. But if they end up with nine or ten wins – that win saved their season because they easily could have been like 0-4. Their, their entire team was especially offensively was injured. You can't run the ball when you have no threat. And then once they get these guys back, you're watching, you're like, holy shit, they are a problem. They, they look like the version of the team we saw at the end of the season last year. And what and the guys they have on defense, you know, they have some rookies playing that are obviously awesome, but they also have second-year second, second year guys that played a ton last year. So now their defense is young, it's fast, full of a bunch of playmakers, and now they got a pass rush? I thought it was going to be very hard for them to replace Donald just because I mean, he's one of the greatest players of all time. But I, I do think they're kind of uh, doing it on quantity. I mean, they just have so many good young players that just, I, I would say just from an effort standpoint, there can't be many defenses in the league that play harder. Just to, just yeah. play in, play out to just play harder. You know, you watch the Ravens sometimes, you're like, God, are they, are they playing hard right now on defense? All right, I want to talk. Listen, Ohio State should have put Penn State away earlier, but they're the better team. Uh, USC, Lincoln Riley is now 12 and 12. Again, they lead late and lose. Oregon thumps Michigan. I think we're, we've spent so much time looking at Texas and Georgia and Bama and Ohio State and last year, Michigan. I watched Oregon this weekend. I'm not sure what they're not good at. Like, I'm, I'm like, the, I'll tell you this. The more I watch Oregon, 
the more I like them. The more I watch Ohio State, the less I like them. I, I, I feel like Ohio State offensively, John, has a bit of an identity crisis. They want to run the ball because they've been criticized for not running it, but their best players are all wide receivers. And then combine that with Will Howard just isn't as good as we thought he was going to be. I figured, I watched him at Kansas State. I thought, you know what? He's getting all these receivers. He may win a Heisman. He's just, he's he's a good college quarterback. I don't see any special and every time I watch Ohio State, I'm like, they leave points on the table. They yeah. they just, it just doesn't feel like I watched Oregon. Oregon is squeezing every freaking ounce of talent out of that roster. I mean, to go on the road in college, even though Michigan's not great and just kick the shit out of them. I mean, the game wasn't even as close as 38-17. No. I just don't think we're ready to embrace this. People outside of the West Coast don't understand. Oregon's dominated Southern California recruiting in the Pac-12 for about eight years. They just get the best players. They pay for them. And I don't know. I think I think, I think think Oregon's the best team I've seen. I, I want to hate Ohio State. I actually thought that was a pretty impressive game yesterday because I thought they shoved around Penn State. They made the big plays when they had to. I mean, Penn State, classic, just blew it in the red zone. I mean, Ohio State is missing mo- multiple offensive linemen. They, I think they had a guy start at left yes. tackle and left guard that had never even played the position, so they're moving guys around. I'm with you on the quarterback, but when you look, it's like, I don't love Georgia's quarterback. You know, Dylan Gabriel can throw the ball. I have more faith in him than those guys, but he's kind of small, and against a big-time defense, like, he yes. knocked out or whatever. But I, I hear yeah. I mean, I, I think Oregon, if you had to pick a team to win the national championship as we sit here today, it would be Oregon. But if Ohio State gets healthy, like, I mean, their talent – that safety that they got from Alabama, they basically oh. just put him on 44, who, you know, that guy is going to be a top 50 pick. I mean, against SC, he had like 50 catches in the game. And he did have a great catch in that game. But for the most part, they neutralized him a little bit. And what a what a letdown by Penn State. If I would have told you they'd be up 10-0 on a pick six, and they would score three points, you know, with five minutes into the game and score three yeah. points the rest of the game, that, that's pretty embarrassing. You know what I feel like with James Franklin? And I, I've met him before, and I do like him. And I see this sometimes in college basketball and football. John Calipari is a little bit of this. Great recruiter. And I feel like there's nothing else he's great at. I mean, there's some guys like Jay Wright was great recruiting, developing, building a defense, creating leaders, um, tight late game situations. I mean, like Jay Wright checked every box. Krzyzewski's offense could be boring, but Mike checked a lot of boxes. So does Bill Self. You know, Calipari's like the guy he can sell and that he deserves credit for that. Um, but when I watch James Franklin, I feel like he's very dependent on having a great offensive coordinator. He can recruit his defense front sevens are always really formidable. They look like an SEC front seven. They always get a pass rush. I just I just think he is sort of um, I just think he is what I see a lot of. He deserves his money. It's a great program. I like watching him play. But I just don't think, I don't think I trust them in tight, big game situations. Where were their wide, where were their wide receivers yesterday? You know, for a guy that is a great recruiter. And like you said, I mean, they got NFL guys all over that roster. I think that's why it's such a letdown. You go, well, our roster is just as good as their roster. I actually think their quarterback, who was awful last year, it's kind of grown on me a little bit this year. Yeah. But their wide receivers make no plays. And they're so dependent on the tight end, who's a really good player, but to get them in that spot, they're all bitching and moaning because it's the morning game. They want the night games. Like, guys, it wouldn't have mattered if the game would have been at midnight or at, you know, five in the morning. <laughs> you, you're you never beating this team. And I just know long, Penn State probably in the playoffs because you look at their schedule, they'll have one loss. But I, I don't take this program seriously at all relative to, like, competing for national championships. Are they going to have a ton of NFL guys? If you're a scout, do you need to spend yep. – Five days a week there during the year? Do you need, yeah. Are they going to win their 10, 11 games, depending on how the schedule breaks? You will never pick them against Ohio State. You will now never pick them against Oregon. And, you know, we'll see if Michigan and USC can get their shit together over the next couple of years. But if those teams are good, you will pick those teams over Penn State as well. And that's kind of crazy because I think this was the first time. It's like, I think Penn State's got a shot. And then they're up 10 nothing. You're like, God, is Ohio State about to get their butt kicked? And yeah. then you're like, no, they're, they're not. Because they just never make a big play when it has to be made. Obviously, the pick at the end of the first half was devastating. They get they, they get that final drive. They're at the goal line, essentially. 
and they can't punch it in the end zone. They just run it right up the gut twice, and then they throw it on fourth down. It wasn't even close. And then Ohio State, with all these random offensive linemen, run it right down their throat, the strength of their team, all these NFL guys, and end the game. That was a big win for Ryan Day, and I'm I, I can be Ohio State hater, but that was that was impressive. DraftKings is offering one million a day in bonus bets for the first ten days of the NBA season. That's ten million in bonus bets. Here's how to shoot your shot: opt in, get a daily NBA profit boost token. You pick a pregame NBA player prop to boost. If that player leads the league that night in points, rebounds, assists, you win a share of a million bucks in bonus bets. Just download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. The code is Colin, C-O-L-I-N, to win a share of a million dollars in bonus bets if your player is king of the court. Only on DraftKings, the crown is yours. To go in there. Yeah, I mean, winning on the road is hard in college, especially when you don't have a superstar quarterback. When you have a solid guy in Will Howard, winning on the road is hard. It is. Yeah. So uh, l- let me touch on USC, Lincoln Riley, 12 and 12. Um, What's I'll their record right s- now, Colin? I think they're four and five or three and what are, what are, yeah, what are they? I think they're four yeah, four and five. That's, yeah. That's yeah. pretty crazy, isn't it? If I would have told you year three, they'd be four and five. I think one of the things that gets really disappointing to me, Lincoln Riley said after the game, you know, six plays and we're nine and oh. And it's like, yeah, not really. Um, I do think offensively they'll be better next year. But I, I think I go back to something like they're getting wiped out in the state of California. They're just not recruiting the state. I don't think I don't think he has a love for recruiting. I think there are some guys that really Saban loved it. He had charisma. Yeah. I think I think there's some guys that really love to recruit. I think Sark, Lane Kiffin, there's a handful of guys. I think Ryan Day is probably a hell of a recruiter. Brian Hartline, his his receiver coach, is a great recruiter. Um, I think sometimes Lincoln comes off as very prickly, very aloof, very detached, overly protective of players. Um, I mean, he he cut off media this week. No more media at the practices. It's like you're four and five. We got better things to do. I think (laughs) (laughs) I think sometimes he's forgetting this is not a rural town like this is we got we got Sean McVay and the Lakers and the Dodgers and Herbert and the Rams. You start cutting people off. Like I it's like I'm a I'm considered sort of pro USC, but when I watch him, I go back to something that I think it's very clear to see. They don't have enough good football players. And and you know, Rick Neuheisel won a Rose Bowl at Washington. They beat Purdue. I didn't think I didn't think Neuheisel was a great coach, but he liked recruiting. He was engaged. He really, really enjoyed the showmanship of it. And Washington's up in the rain in the Pacific Northwest. They had Marcus Tuiasasopo at quarterback. But I always come out of it, and I'm like, you know what? If you if you recruit at college, Charlie Weiss couldn't recruit. He was a smart guy. He couldn't recruit. I, I, I just look at their brand. They have literally one serviceable offensive tackle. They have one running back. They're very pass happy. I, I, I look at it, and I think to myself, they'll be better next year. I don't see special. I don't see the players. Yeah, I mean, I if you would have told me this would have taken place after they beat LSU, I wouldn't have believed you because it was clear like LSU was going to be a good team. And if they beat Alabama next week, Colin, they're going to be 10 and 2 and be a playoff team. Yeah. You know, so it's to, for them to end up four and five. And like, are we sure they're, I mean, six and six? They've proven now they can lose to anybody. I think the craziest part, and it hit me last night, I'm watching the game. They're down 20 to 7. And I'm just like, they're about to get rolled. I just turned on other games. I was actually shocked when I went back to my phone and saw that the game was close, so then I turned it back on. But it's barely November 1st, and they don't they don't matter in the college landscape. Like, you watch, and you know some of their fans watch the whole game because they're invested in the program. But I didn't need to watch. I, I, I was paying attention because I know we talk about it, but they don't matter. It does. If you talk about John, college football, don't, you don't need to watch them. Which no. year three paying them one hundred twenty million? This is an epic disaster, Colin. John, they don't have anything resembling a first round player. They don't have anything. They have a center that'll go in about the third round. They have a safety in about a year. I think will go in the third. Kind of a third round player. They have some nice receivers. None feel like first round players. They they have thirteen million dollars in NIL. Go buy an elite left tackle for a million dollars. Go buy the best rush in, in in football. They don't have, I mean, Washington's in a rebuild. 
I'm not sure they have more good players than Washington. And Washington's in a rebuild with Jed Fish in his first year. I, I would say this. I mean, he's not going and nothing's going to happen, but UCLA has showed some fight this season. Oh, like yeah. They've, they've at least shown some character. And if he were to lose that game, regardless, I mean, now the record, would you agree the record's kind of irrelevant? Whether they go, well, I don't right. even know what bowl games mean anymore in this college football. Do bowl games even still exist? <laughs> uh, but that that would be, it'd be hard for people around the program and the money people to take him seriously. I mean, it is right now at four and five into year three. Like people are on Brian Kelly. I mean, he's he has a bad half against Texas A&M on the road. You know, when they, they have a million NFL guys. Like I... He was kicking their ass for a half. Like he's right. you watch, and I watch a lot of LSU because I love watching the SEC. It's where the best players are. He's doing a pretty good job. And you talk to my scouting buddies are like, it's a, it's an impressive operation there. When you go in there, they're like, I would buy stock in this program moving forward. Yeah. That is not the case. And like you said, the 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 reporter thing, he did that last year. He does it like Lincoln. Why are you even worried about things that are just completely irrelevant to? Can you beat Jed Fish? I mean, Jed Fish should have beat you two years in a row. You remember they got very lucky to beat him last year. Was that that game go to overtime? Maybe beat him on the last play of the game. Yep. Caleb made an incredible play in overtime. Remember he kind of scrambled. Yep. They easily could have lost that game. They were lucky to be seven and five last year because they lose that thing. They're six and six. And it looks like they're headed towards six and six. And I would say you're six and six, and you lose to this UCLA team with Deshaun Foster. <laughs> they're not paying you 120 million dollars for that. And like you said, think of all of the top coaches. Dan Lanning. I mean, loves to recruit. Clearly. Like you say, Ryan Day and that program, they recruit their ass off. Kirby Smart, recruiter, Sark, huge. So the top programs, which USC, LSU, and you know, Brian Kelly puts a lot of effort into it. They hired you to be their equals. Well, you know, coaching right now is not going that well, but it's like, okay, college football is not quite the NFL. If you just got the Jimmies and the Joes, you could win, especially at SC, what, eight, nine games, no doubt about it. Then you got yep. out coach to get to undefeated or a one loss. Your Jimmy's in the Joes. <laughs> SC didn't, they didn't play Oregon this year, did they? They kind of got lucky. Or Ohio State. They get run <laughs> out of the stadium with those So they, they got lucky with their schedule. It could be way worse, right? Listen, Clay Helton could not recruit or develop, but he tried. He had an effort. I I mean, it, it, USC fans come up and ask me, I'm like, go watch the games. They don't have any separators. Their receivers, they have a kid named Lemon, runs good routes, good hands. They don't have anybody that separates. They got a safety, a center. Woody Marks, the transfer running back, is a nice player. He's probably a fourth, fifth rounder, nice player. They don't have a second running back in the program. They have one tackle that can play offensively. They have no great pass rushers. They just they just don't have any good play. They don't have enough quality. If, if you took the best 10 Ohio State players and the USC, the best 10, Ohio State's got eight of them. Well, is there a chance that, like, the point of difference of Lincoln, who was supposed to be this genius offensive guy, the gap between him, like, Jed Fish, an offensive guy who's coached with the best in the business, and his staff has a Belichick and a, and a Carroll. Obviously, Dan Lanning's staff is elite. You know, Ryan Day and Chip Kelly don't suck. I mean, you look around the conference, you go, uh, you got to beat some pretty well-coached staffs. Iowa's a well-coached staff. You got some of these teams, it's just going to be very, very difficult for them if they are not recruiting the best. I mean, Pete Carroll in his heyday had the best of both worlds, right? Go elite look, staff, go to, elite go players. To, go to rivals.com, 2025 recruiting California, AM, Texas, Oregon, Texas AM, LSU. There's no US, USC's got one rush in, good kid from about 30 minutes outside of LA up north. They're not getting any of the players. Well, think about this. If you're a kid right now, Let's say you're 17 years old for your entire life, starting at like eight, nine years old, when you kind of start really understanding sports, SC's never been relevant. So you, you don't remember like a uh, Matt Liner thrown to Dwayne Jarrett. You weren't even born. <laughs> so it's like, wait, maybe you were born in 06. Those teams have already, they were done. So how this notion of like momentum is a real thing, right? I think Schefter had a report today. Like people are interested in going to the commanders. Don't blame them. I would be too. Yeah. No one would have said that eight months ago. Things change faster than ever in society. If you're a kid, like, I'd want to go to Oregon. I'd want to go to Georgia. I'd want to go to LSU. I'd want to go, hell, South Carolina, beat the crap at AM. They look cool. You know, Ohio State. I, why would you want to go to SC? What, what have they done over the last, I would just say, 10 years to be, if you're a young kid, like, I want to go there. We talk about it a lot because we remember these moments. They yeah. do not. 
And, yeah. and now with social media and stuff, their moments are, they don't even exist. So I think he has a lot to overcome. And this gets to the thing is like, can he build from scratch? Cause that's what this needed. And it doesn't look like he really can. Where Jed yep. Fish is a good example, went to Arizona. That was a disaster. What he proved that he was able to do. And look at Arizona this year. They stink again. Yeah. It's like that, that is really difficult to do to go to a program just in general in college football that's down and out, let alone a non power program and turn it into a 9 10 win team. He took over Bob Stoops' team, which he inherited, I don't know, a team full of over under probably 20 NFL guys that all start yep. in the league right now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what worries me, even the guys outside of Caleb Williams that he brought from Oklahoma to USC, this is one of the first warning signs. He brought about six guys from Oklahoma to USC. One could play. One. one and, the, guy and, the, could play. And, and the Jordan Addison move, which obviously was a really good move, you know, they had Caleb, like, is he getting Jordan Addison this offseason? Like the equivalent of that guy? No chance, right? Where's that I mean, guy they've got. Go? One of their starters Oregon in the D-line is from Wyoming. One of the starters in their O-line is from Wyoming. They're cherry-picking Wyoming players in the transfer portal. Like, they're just not – they just don't have a good enough sales pitch. And that's college I think, football I, and basketball. I think, this, I think the sad thing is if you're a big, you know, L.A. SC booster and money guy, you look around college football, it's not like there are these programs that are head and shoulder. Like, it is very winnable right now. I, yeah. I would say most of these teams, like you said, Oregon has really got their swag back after beating Ohio State. But I have watched Georgia against Florida. They don't look great. I mean, it's not like Ohio State. This is their best team in the last 20 years. Probably wouldn't even be a top five team in the last 20 right. years. So you look around college football, you go, well, Alabama's kind of meh for their standards. LSU's got some issues. Like well, Notre is, Dame. We yeah. should, yeah. What are, what are we doing here? We can't we can't even sniff those. Two. We can't even beat Washington. What's Washington? A seven win team? <laughs> that's that's a problem, Colin. That's a problem. John Middlecoff, former NFL scout, three and out. As always, buddy, great talking to you. See you, Colin. Fight on, baby.